But thank you for joining us for our Wednesday webinar series, Lunch with the Birds, presented by the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. Uh, my name is Amanda Duran, and I am the program coordinator um, for the Ohio Bird Conservation Initiative. So thank you um, for taking some time today over your lunch break um, to learn a little bit about creating um, certified um, backyard uh, wildlife habitat. Um, but before I introduce our speaker for today, I wanted to um, remind you about um, our upcoming webinar, which will be on um, Friday, August 22nd at noon. And for those of you that, that typically join us um, every month for this series, I do want you to note that this is on a different day. We usually, <clears throat> as the name implies, are always on a Wednesday, but um, our speaker had a scheduling conflict, so we'll be doing Wednesday, August 22nd next month. And um, the topic will be fall warblers. So those of you that joined us um, a few months back with Tom Sheely for his presentation on spring warblers, this is kind of a follow-up on fall warblers and, and some tips on their somewhat tricky, um, frustrating identification. So some suggestions on how to identify those um, those birds and a little bit more about their ecology and, and some of the migration that go through here in Ohio. And that will be with Scott Alball from um, Zane State College. So that will be up on our website at obcinet.org, which I will be um, putting in here in the chat box um, so that you can um, uh, register for that um, starting next week. And I also want to remind you that today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted to our YouTube channel, which is um, youtube.com slash obci1. And we have um, about 15 archived webinars um, that we've given previously. So if you're new to the series and haven't joined us before, definitely suggest um, checking out some of those archived webinars on a whole variety of topics. Um, we have other education topics like um, inquiry-based education to learn about birds and, and nest boxes, um, preventing window collisions. So there's a whole variety of topics. I definitely um, urge you to, to check that out and, and view some of those that you weren't able to join us for previously. And uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker today, um, Barbara Barboza has a degree in early childhood education and retired in 2008 from teaching and directing a child care program. She has been the program chair for Wild Ones Columbus Chapter since 2010 and in 2013 she became an ambassador for the National Wildlife Federation Backyard Certified Habitat Program. Barbara is also a DNR facilitator for Project Learning Tree, Project Wild, Project Wet, and Healthy Water, Healthy People. She loves taking photos and gardening of any kind. Uh, in 2013, Barbara became a Master Gardener volunteer for, Fair, for Fair, Fairfield County. Excuse me. As you can see, she loves to learn and still considers herself to be learning something new every day. Um, she's married with three sons, four grandchildren, and two cats. So um, with that, I'm going to um, bring up your presentation, Barbara, and I will turn it over to you. Hi. Welcome to National Wildlife Federation Backyard Certified Habitat Program. Um, in hopes I'm in going through the program, I'm going to inspire you and all Americans to protect wildlife for our children's future. <clears throat> Creating backyard uh, habitats. Um, creating a, a National Wildlife uh, Certified Habitat helps people to connect with nature by providing, providing much needed resources for native wildlife. As many of us know, animals are losing their natural habitat at a rapid rate. Not everyone with access to land and water can help. We can connect with nature and do our part to help wildlife find homes by creating habitats to provide them the basic resources they survive and thrive. A wildlife habitat is a collection of elements in an environment where an organism lives that are necessary for its survival. Reasons for the, the loss of habitat, development, decreasing food sources, uses of pesticides, destruction of native plants, elements to create a habitat are food, water, cover, places to raise young and sustainable gardening practices. Um, when you look, if you decide to do a wildlife habitat on the National Wildlife um, 
website, they have a become a habitat area. And these are the four areas. It doesn't say sustainable gardening, but that goes in place with each of these as you're going through the seminar today. And you will see how um, many of each of these particular groups, you, groups of areas you would need to qualify for habitat. Um, Making a place for wildlife starts at home. This is a picture of my house. Um, wish I had a current picture. This is last year's picture. And these flowers are just, were put in the fall of 2011. And in 2012, this is what it looked like. And now in 2014, imagine that tripled. So what I've been able to do with the native plants here is take them and create more habitats in my yard. But these are my grandsons. That's why I mentioned them in my bio. Um, we took a, this is how we prepared a bed. There are several ways you can prepare a bed for a habitat, but this is an 80 by 60 area in the front of my house. And they helped with uh, moving the sod. That's a sod cutter and a gentleman that helped, but it was fun and you can do it anywhere in an urban area, suburban or royal, just depending on what kind of a size of a habitat you want. And not some people even create a habitat out of container gardening on their patio. It's easy to have your yard certified as an official certified wildlife habitat site. Um, just visit the website and check it out. Who can do it? Anyone can provide a basic habitat. If my grandsons can do it, so can you. Um, what we did was there's several steps to conserve the resources in your yard that apply for certification. What we did here was this was an old playground area that we had moved a place set off of and put it somewhere else. And we took this area, rescued plants out of an environment. These are all native plants and we plant them. And this is just six months later. That's the little one. He loves the water, so they got plenty of water. <laughs> Native. <clears throat> what I'd like to explain to you, though, when it comes to plants is native versus non-native. Um, the native plants that I talked about in the previous photo are the ones that naturally occur in a region and are native to this region. And sometimes that doesn't mean necessarily Ohio. It can be surrounding regions like uh, Kentucky, um, Indiana. Um, so regional, when you look at a regional map, you would look at the regions and plants from those areas are acceptable and usable in Ohio. And a native plant is a plant that evolved to the soil type, the climate, precipitation, the living organi organisms that live in that ecological community. Native plants are adapted to local conditions. Once they're established, they require no fertilizer, no pesticides, and supplemental water to survive, which really saves a homeowner and businesses quite a bit of money. Um, exotic plants are those that are introduced to the ecosystem by humans. Um, some of those are your cultivars that you buy that might be a purple cone flower years ago now can be uh, purchased in almost any color. Those are considered um, cultivars. They're not necessarily native. Uh, invasive plants are exotics that rapidly compete with the native plants and then they, they take up so much space that they crowd the native plants out. And these are just some of them. This is a nanoberry bush and each of these native plants are um, versus a non-native plant. But the berries uh, feed the birds and um, they just, and the nanny berries are also something that humans can eat. The birds can eat it, we can eat it for the most part. <laughs> uh, this is an Eastern Wahoo bush. Kind of what we do is encourage this as a native plant instead of the burning bush, which a lot of us typically see. It's not invasive, it doesn't reseed. Um, you can still trim it however you, however you would like it to look. Some people like them round, some people like them to go natural. So it is trainable like the burning bush, but the, uh, this is something we would uh, consider less invasive. You don't have those little seedlings like you have with a burning bush. Uh, the spice bush, this is a really cool plant. You can't eat the spices from here. If you can see down in this corner, the black, um, black swallowtail um, loves the blooms on here. They love to feed off of this and it's really got some, the spices itself can be made in different recipes. And this is the glossy buckhorn, buckhorn which is a non-native. Then you have your down service berry. My son just planted one of these in his property and they actually, they go out every Saturday morning, pick the berries and put them in their, in their cereal. So 
they think that's pretty pretty cool. <laughs> and then the autumn, uh, the autumn olive leaf. Not a lot of people purchase these anymore because they're not a really pretty tree, but they still are out there, there in the wild, and they've become invasive because people have dug them up and just threw them out there. And these berries are not edible. Um, butterflies as pollinators. Um, in March and April, the eggs are laid of a monarch butterfly are laid on milkweed plants. This is the generation of the monarch that will die after laying eggs for generation number two. The second generation of monarch butterflies is born in May and June, and the third generation is born in July and August. There are four generations of monarch butterflies it is a little bit different than the first three generations. That fourth generation that's born is born in September and October, and the fourth generation of butterflies do not die. Those are the ones that travel over to um, Mexico for warmer climate and California. They've also been known to um, migrate to California, and they will live six, six to eight months until it's time for them to fly all the way back here again. Pretty creative creatures. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I could do that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> plant wildlife connections. Some types of wildlife depend on only one type of native plant for survival. For example, like I just said, the monarch butterfly can only survive on milkweed. And right here is a picture, if you've never seen one, of a monarch caterpillar. And he's actually feeding on, this is swamp, uh, swamp milkweed. And I have put my swamp milkweed in um, areas that aren't wet all the time. They just have a little bit of water laying after a rain, but and the swamp milkweed does fine. Or my roses, uh, I have them in my rose garden also. And um, I water the roses quite a bit and um, they get plenty of water from that. So any bed that you tend to water a lot, the swamp milkweed does fine in that bed also. These are four species of native plants that are used here in Ohio. <clears throat> and um, there's actually 16 different species. If you look on the ODNR website, it can give you all of the list of um, milkweed that's available. And not only the monarch, but other butterflies and moths also lay their eggs on, the, on milkweed. So you have the horsetail milkweed, which is dry area or moist. And then the swamp milkweed, even though it says swamp, like I said, you can put it in an area that you know, is watered frequently. Uh, butterfly weed does like a drier area, it does not like to have its feet wet. And the purple milkweed, it's a beautiful milkweed, gets about, can get up to eight feet high, but it is just uh, something that they really love too. And I don't have the common milkweed listed on here, I believe it's in the next picture. Um, and this is just a little bit about the life cycle of the butterfly. I know I just read a short survey, but this kind of tells you a little bit more about how each cycle works and how the milkweed is used. Um, in March and April is when the eggs are started to lay. And then the butterfly goes into the four stages, starting with cycle one. And like I said, there are four generations. <clears throat> the eggs are laid on the milkweed. And there's up to 200 eggs that are laid on this. They're very, very, very tiny white eggs. Sometimes you do not see this many on a leaf. Sometimes you're only going to have one or two or three on a leaf, and they might lay some here. But if you watch her lay her eggs, if you're anywhere near common milkweed when she lays, you can see her little tail go down. And then she touches just the bottom of these, bottom of the bottom of the leaf is where she lays her egg. And that typically happens on the common milkweed. That's the most popular plant that they like to lay their eggs on, although they will lay them on other milkweed. Um, this is a caterpillar. Now this baby will hatch. <clears throat> the eggs hatch into a caterpillar, which is also called larva. And this is a probably, I would say about a week old. When they're born, they're probably like an eighth of an inch and they're green. And you, they almost cannot be seen on the leaf because they match the leaf identically. And it takes about four days for this for this to hatch after the eggs are born. So if you're not quick getting the eggs and want to start a nursery, you got to be out there looking every day. This is fun. <laughs> the jay, <clears throat> this is forming the uh, the pupa. After two weeks, the caterpillar will be fully grown and find a place to attach itself. So when I say attach itself, doesn't necessarily have to be on milkweed. Um, people that raise monarchs, sometimes they build like um, areas for them to um, 
attach and put the J on. They'll take the caterpillars after about a week and let them get used to the environment. And then they'll put the uh, caterpillar in there and let them form their egg. But keep in mind, if you do that, you do need to have some milkweed plant in the container with them so that they can continue to eat until they're, until they're ready to do this poop this stage. And they'll attach it and it's when they form the silk into a chrysalis. And this is a chrysalis, it's gorgeous. It's jade and it's got a gold bead on here. Yeah, it goes in, it's outside in 10 days, the chrysalis phase seems to be <clears throat> when there's nothing happening. The time is, it may, it's a really rapid change. Within the chrysalis, the old parts of the butterfly are undergoing a remarkable transformation, which all of you know is called a metamorphosis. And also I wanted to mention too, which you do not have a picture of, um, these. Like I said, the chrysalis can be on any plant in your yard. It does not necessarily have to be on a milkweed plant. And right before the, the monarch comes out, this chrysalis will turn black and it will have a gold bead. This gold bead will still be there. But if you watch it and you save them or if you do a monarch um, nursery uh, and then release the monarchs and tag them, you can um, watch slowly as they come out of their chrysalis once it turns black. It's really really cool. This is the adult monarch. Now a monarch, a male monarch, I don't have a picture over here, but it has two black dots back here. That's how you can tell them apart. So this is a female and a male has two black dots back here, but this is the adult stage. Now remember I said there are four generations and four different butterflies going through these four stages during one year until it's time to start over again and then they start in generation one. So it's kind of confusing. It's almost like everybody thinks, oh, the monarchs were born. Now we have to watch that same monarch. Well, there's four generations born from the beginning of their birthing time when they start laying eggs to the end. It's only the fourth generation that actually flies to Mexico. These are herbs. A lot of people say, oh, I don't know. I don't like having herbs in my garden. Some people like herb gardens. I'm not going to read the entire list to you, but this is a picture of dill. <clears throat> I don't know. I didn't put the picture in here, but my grandsons, I have dill in my herb garden. I also stick dill and I also use um, fennel. They and the tiger, the, 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 the swallowtail likes fennel. And right there, that's a tiger swallowfly. And this is a, a caterpillar for a tiger swallowfly. They're actually on dill. And they also like um, parsley too. Butterfly puddles. A lot of people don't think about the butterflies being thirsty as they're flying around and where do they get their water. I have a current picture, which this is completely covered now with swamp milkweed. And then I've added some different grasses and stuff to it. I'm sorry I didn't update it for today's seminar. But if you visit a, another workshop, I'll have that. And this is a picture I've taken in my yard. And this is a picture of Tony Staw. She is the wildlife, um, National Wildlife Ambassador that trained me to become a certified ambassador in 2013. And you'll see a lot of Tony's pictures here as well as mine. She's an amazing person. And she also has a, a free um, month monthly cattle, um, newsletter. It's called Nature Scoop. And Amanda will give you that information um, on the website um, after the end of this. But you just simply take a mason dirt, topsoil, cow manure, um, and you mix that all together, like one third, one third, one third. And then you put a stump or a tree in there. And I've got some stumps that have cracks so they can winter over in. And then Tony uses rocks so they can sit on the rocks and, and they keep this moist. Um, and some people actually can use like just a plastic tray from a pot, um, like a, and they keep water and rocks in there and keep water in there. But this, if you keep the sand moist or the manure moist, um, they love it. And the males actually like the manure. I don't know why. <laughs> they, they like to sit in the manure more than the females. So I also have rocks added to this area now so that the females and males can actually hang out together. And as we talked about the, um, the, the butterflies and staying around in September, um, that's when a lot of your nectar plants are going to be out there. Some of them aren't going to be born early enough or have the strength to fly all the way, way to Mexico and California. So you can create a, uh, it's called a butterfly log cabin. You just take firewood. It doesn't have to be any particular kind. This is pine, but you put a couple small pieces of like a one by two on the ground and you put plastic down on this lower level. And then you just um, 
put a row one way and zigzag it the other way and build it about three feet high, cover it with plastic, put logs on top to keep the plastic down. Everyone says, why plastic? Well, this plastic keeps the air from cutting through there and it gives them some winter shield. And I leave that up year round. And and uh, during the summer, it's a great place for bugs and insects to hang out too. And the bats like that. So place for butterflies in the winter, a place for bats to eat in the summer and spring. <laughs> Um, and talking about bees, um, hopsis is a really nice plant. And these are all the different, I'm um, not going to read all of them to you. You can visit the website at a later time, but uh, it's a great pollinator um, to have for bees. Bee house. <clears throat> um, while the importance of honeybees for our food supply has been well publicized by the media, the role of native pollinators, such as the orchid mason bee, orchard, I'm sorry, orchard mason bee and the butterfly bee in our ecology is what less widely recognized. We are dedicated to increasing the cultural and environmental awareness of orchard mason bees, bumblebees, and many other native bee pollinators. Um, I do not know if you guys are aware that uh, there is a very uh, high shortage of bees right now, and a lot of people are um, creating <clears throat> beehives. I haven't got one of those yet, but I will next year. Since my grandsons will be in school full time, my daughter-in-law didn't want me to raise bees out here. But next year, since they'll be in school, I will be. One thing I do want to mention when you order a beehive, and sometimes people will make them at craft sales and sell them, these uh, cones down here, they need to be six, six to eight inches long. Um, I know there's a couple of things online that tell you to take a four by four and drill it, but that's not near deep enough for the bee to build its layers to feed through the winter. So it needs to be six inches long when you purchase one of these, or you can make your own. A really cool thing to make this out of is um, sedum. Just let the branches grow long and it's hollow. So you can roll those up and twine them together and just stick them in a, a, a V of a tree. And that's a great place for bees to have to winter over. And doesn't cost you anything. Just recycle that sedum. <laughs> Herbs that attract um, the hummingbird. I just put these in here just so people are aware that, and any of these, like I say, any of these are beautiful in a garden too. Even with perennials, not necessarily native, but the herbs are a great accent to any garden. Plants that attract birds. We have, uh, I have gray-headed coneflower. I don't have it noted on here. This is a sunflower. I do have lots of sunflowers also. And I do have bird feeders up that create sunflowers, as all of you probably know, where you'd least expect to have them. You will have a sunflower. But um, <laughs> but the bee balm, the marigold, the verbena, and the yarrow is really nice. But they also love, I have gray-headed coneflowers, and the finch just absolutely love it. I'll have up to 30 finch at a time in my front lawn that I showed you at the beginning. Bats as pollinators, a lot of people don't think about bats as being pollinators, but they are, and it's because of what they can get into. What do bats like to eat? We'll see. Right now, this one's just hanging out in a tiger lily, but these are some of the plants that you can put in your garden to attract, to attract bats. This is what they like to eat. They like to eat moths. They like to eat grasshoppers. They like to eat millipedes. And they like to eat mayflowers, beetles, mosquitoes, and midges. And all the plants that I showed you before, plus many, many more, attract bats. And you can also create a bat garden and build a bat house. And you can also find information to that online. This seminar could go on for hours, ladies, so I'm going to try and rush through it for you. Um, and this is something they enjoy. We always we have just a couple of birds that come every day, and I put a bat box up recently because I'm going to catch these guys eating hummingbird food. I know it's just a matter of time. The bat box, um, I actually uh, had one made in um, <clears throat> on vacation, and it's uh, 36 uh, feet. 36 inches wide, about 18 inches long. And then he actually, instead of putting, you can put small runs up through here for the bats to climb. He used like a wire, heavy wire um, fencing, small, real like a half inch square. 
He said that's what he'd been using and selling them for years. And I said, okay, I'll try it. So bats play a key in, in our ecosystem. Uh, the boxes are nice to have a habitat because we don't have natural caves around us. Birdscaping. Extinct birds, if you want birds to visit, you can um, be very worthwhile, enjoyable project. There's much you can do to make your yard a more bird friendly habitat. Agencies such as the Division of Wildlife, the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and the Ohio De and um, <clears throat> suggest uh, creating an environment for birds, providing food, cover, water, making an F, making an F, um, creating bird feeding stations and designing a natural habitat are more helpful to birds than anything though. Um, the Ohio Landscaping Association has created a list with goals for locally available plants and you can visit that. Um, I will have that website also listed on the um, her website and Facebook. Late spring to summer and midsummer. Late summer to midsummer means nesting time when birds need a lot of food to rear their young. This bird right here is on a service berry. And it tells you exactly how many different species. The service berry tree, which is a native tree that we discussed in the beginning, services 26 different species of birds. In late fall, the majority of plants that produce seeds and fruit late in summer and fall it's a good thing too. This means migration time for some birds and winter preparation for others. So this is a gray dogwood, which is a gorgeous tree. And they can get up to 20 foot high. So these bushes can also become, they have dog, a red, dog, red twig dogwood bushes that can get 20, up to 20 feet high, or you can plant the trees. But uh, they attract 15 different species of birds. Winter into early spring, uh, plants with winter persist with persistent fruit or seed are particularly essential when other food suppliers are limited or exhausted. Permanently residing birds and early spring migrators can find such plants to be lifesavers. If your yard space is limited, this could be the best category from which to choose. Now, this is just a chokeberry a, um, bush tree it's a beautiful tree i just saw some on a, a tour i was on it's it doesn't get really big you could trim it and keep it the size you want um and it has it serves 43 different species of birds look at him he's just loving that or or her <laughs> i'm still learning my birds bird feeders bird feeders are a type of wildlife that can be safe to feed with supplement feeders one thing is the bird feeders only supply 25% of a bird's needs. It's not something that they can entirely survive on. It's just a supplement. Um, water bath, uh, bird baths are easy way to provide water. Uh, one thing you do need to remember is if you get it too high, you could drown the little guys. So it's best to keep it two or three inches deep, regardless of the size of the bird feeder or put rocks in there so they can sit on and get their water. And it's very important that they be cleaned, um, kept clean. Uh, they recommend at least two or three days, depending on where you have it. You just need to check it often. Native vegetation is best. The best way to provide food for wildlife and preserve is to restore natural plant communities for birds, bees, butterflies, bats, all of them. And I'm not going to read through this list, but this is a goldfinch eating thistle. Um, and this is uh, the perennial plants, and this was uh, a picture taken by Tony in her yard. We all have several pictures, so. Um, another role of native plants is a vegetation provides cover. Um, although the monarch butterfly, I don't know if I mentioned this, they eat milkweed, <clears throat> and the common milkweed has a, the milk in the milkweed that the butterfly actually feeds on the leaf has a poison that is poisonous to other birds. So if they do try to eat a butterfly, a monarch butterfly, they will get sick. So the birds don't typically bother um, your monarch butterflies. Um, I do have a picture of a, a tiger swallow, a black tail swallow fly that they've just kind of tore it all apart, but it's still living and it's still surviving. So it must be ducking in and out of some kind of plants. 
squirrels, uh, pesty little guys for some folks, and some folks love to watch them. But they have feeders. Uh, the thing they like the most is the special feeders you can get for the store, Wild Birds Unlimited. I don't believe I mentioned him on my website, but Tom Seeley did do a presentation. He's got some great squirrel feeders, bird feeders, butterfly feeders, and he um, can recommend what kind of feeder you would need for your property, but uh, they love corn. So if you buy bird seed that has corn in it, you're going to get squirrels and you're going to get crows. So if you can buy a bird seed that doesn't have any corn in it, it kind of eliminates attracting little friends you may not want in your yard. Mimic nature. Uh, the best thing you can do is to mimic uh, nature is to try to structure a native plant environment for your house. This picture here was taken at a home I did a, a talk at. Um, and her whole yard has no grass. The whole yard is made up of uh, trees, shrubs. She's got a gazebo. She adds little art figures to dress it up. Um, and this is something you can create on your own. And also, this is Guy Denny's uh, prairie. He's got 22 acres of uh, used to be cornfield years ago. He started developing a prairie area and brought it all back to natural prairie. Um, if you haven't visited that, um, he always welcomes friends. It's a beautiful and peaceful place to go in all the seasons. There's something out there every season to see. The role of water. Water is needed and vital to the function of wildlife. Now, this is Kathy's yard again. I'm oh, sorry. Um, this is the, where I went. You could saw part of around her deck, but she has two water, water ponds that she put in. These are man-made and installed. They're absolutely gorgeous, but they're perfect for the perfect for any kind of animal to come in and get the water that they need with the rocks and the, the trees and things around there. This is the second pond that she has. And it just gives you an example of what you can do. She used flexible liners to put these in and then she just created with rocks and stones around there. Quarry is the best place to buy your stone. If you can find a stone quarry and you want to do something like this, that's the best place to go and find stone to put in and build your quarry. I got lots of resources for this stuff too, so, but that'd be a different whole seminar. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a vernal pool someone built, uh, run off from their property. They were having trouble with water lying. So what they did is their house is up on this part of the picture. They've taken it and they've got the water and they've created their own little vernal pool. So that's another man-made thing that they've done with excess water from their home. So the earth bottom, is, this is the earth bottom. What they did is they dug this down deeper and then it has a slow outlet. They have like a riverbed they put back here. This is my yard. This is actually in 2009. It's had some big changes since then. Um, this is where I was killing off grass and I'll show, I think I might have a picture of where it's starting to grow, but I burned off and that's with uh, herbicide. I used uh, kills all. And through a whole season prior to planting prairie grasses, you have to get rid of the grass. And the best way to do that is not sounding very earth friendly, but in long term, it will it takes care of quite a few um, birds and butterflies and bees and things like that. But you kill the grass off the entire season. And then in the winter, you do this in the fall. And in the winter is when you spread your seed, when the ground is freezing and thawing. This is a rain garden. It has naturally expanded itself out to here now. <laughs> and so that is completely full of plants. But you have to worry about the amphibians too. And um, they need a place to survive. So, and I'm trying to create a vernal pool back here and still working on that one. Five acres, it's a big project for me. So. The food chain, just providing food for all levels on the food chain to ensure thriving habitat. It's filled with wildlife. This little frog runs around my backyard, and when he's running, the kids are right behind him. Uh, clay pot. A lot of places you can go and buy a toad adobe, but if you just take in, um, broken clay pots, which I have plenty of with my grandson around, um, you can stack these and make a safe haven just in a quiet place close to the pond or close to some source of water by your rain spout. Um, leave a watering can out. They like to go in there. At least they do in mine. I go to use a watering can. There's always a frog in there. <laughs> and try to find him a home to live in. He likes my watering can. 
wetlands. This is a guy, Denny's, and this was man-made at one time. And he's got beautiful water lilies. And these are actually, uh, it's very hard to find now, but these are native cattails that he has out there. And he has several plants all around. Hibiscus, it's just a beautiful area. Um, take advantage of the wet areas. Create a wetland by using storm runoff from roofs. This creates a habitat and provides food. This is a this is a storm runoff from his hills that he has. He has several small hills. In Ohio, everybody has hills, but he's got some small hills and all that water from the other prairie areas run into these. He's got two ponds actually out there. Little frog I found sitting on a lily pad out there. And it attracts wildlife. One thing you need to remember is when you put a pond in, either put a log in, rocks, or some kind of plant for them to be able to climb out of the water on. So that's important in a wildlife habitat. Shallow water. This is a picture Tony took. And what she's done is she's got a heated dish down here. And in the winter, she um, puts that dish on so the birds have fresh water all winter. And I use an electric dog dish and I have stones around it. Yes, everybody thought I was crazy, but it works. <laughs> yeah, I know. I've learned it at a workshop. So always pays to be learning. Like I say, I learn every day and I love it. How do you provide cover? Uh, there's two ways, just natural cover in the plants and native plants and shrubberies and trees that you put in. This is a picture Tony took. You can hardly see the little guy in there. And then this is from guys, you have your nesting boxes. This is something interesting. Tony always wanted to have chimney sweeps. So she had this built. She does have the instructions online for it. This is a Christmas gift I've asked for two years. I'm hoping the third year's a charm. I figure for five acres, I should be able to have that built. So we'll see. And there they're eating um, must, um, mustard. And then you've got your birds sitting in a nest. And one thing we do like to recommend, if you see a bird nest, leave it there. Um, it's always used by someone else if that bird decides to abandon it. But they might redecorate it, but it's it's used. <laughs> okay. Dead and dying plants. This is my seed bed. You can't really see too much of it right now. That's a tree that's um, actually a, I uh, can't think of it right now. It needs to come out of there. It's, it's a listed on invasive plants, but it's not invasive in my yard because I only have two of them. So I tend to keep things that I like because I'm not 100% perimitive native, but I do um, have a lot of native plants. But keep your 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 dead stalks at your herbaceous plants and you just, uh, it's a great place for insects and like I say, butterflies and things in the winter. Um, Many species rely on cavities and dead standing trees called snags for cover. Leaf snags in the grasslands wherever possible, native cavities and rocks or in the ground are important for a source cover, is a, an important for a cover for many species of wildlife that could be protected by uh, preserves. Um, this is just a picture I found, but um, they told me there's a little raccoon that lives in here, so. Like he's been carrying some stuff in there, but this is, if you, and I like to collect logs that have holes in them and I leave them around my property because I don't have a lot of trees yet, as you can see by the pictures. Um, still working on getting trees, but building a native prairies uh, currently is my goal. Um, this is part of my property. I've got some bird boxes. I've got a little sitting area with a, a bird box and a bird feeder and there used to be a water dish hanging from here that the wind blew off but this is uh and I've got uh trumpet vine for hummingbirds and bats growing up this and this is an old picture too sorry about not updating that these are pictures from Tony's these are just some of the many many pictures that she has online and um places to bear young and raise um and to raise young space for courtship and mating, space for digging, building nests and dens, nesting materials. Um, she has a whole list of nesting materials online too that you can put out for birds. Um, they like yarn. They ask you not to use cotton anymore because it tends to mold. Cotton or dryer uh, fibers were used at one time, but they're asking not to use cotton anymore. 
but old mop strings, hair, human hair, they like that. Um, even plastic cellophane from gift wraps, and ribbons and stuff like that. Uh, they will use that stuff to nest with. And any old grass that you have, grass clippings that have dried out, they use a lot of those. Um, safe conditions for adults and offsprings, what it provides, uh, resources for juvenile wildlife and resources for caregiving adults. So providing a place to bear young is very important for national wildlife. <clears throat> Grasslands. Okay, this is my this is my project. I think I showed you the beginning that place that was um, completely killed off now. And what I did was I put down the seed, and this is what it will look like when it's completely grown. This is actually a picture of Guy Denny's, but this is what I'm working toward. This particular this is Indian grass. This is cup plant. There's some cone flowers in there. He's got some gray headed. You can't see them all. Really suggest that you go visit there. But if you have a large area and you want equipment mow in your yard, this would be the place to go. <laughs> the grassland areas are one example of native plant communities that provide important places for a variety of wildlife to raise their young. And I actually have in my back, I don't have it um, mowed down yet, but I've got five acres and the last acre in the back, I let all the grass grow high and I've got all kind of wildlife. I've got deer that lay back there and but I've, I have a wood uh, pile of woods tree trimmings and stuff that I have in the back. My youngest grandson says, let's go see the beaver dam. I, I, can't, I don't want to break his heart in time. I don't have a beaver yet, but I do have a pile of wood <laughs> that looks like the beavers have put it back there. <laughs> and <laughs> he always wants to go adventure hunting. So um, this is actually my yard a year. The next year, I showed you at the beginning, the first picture when it was just uh, a few things blooming. This is last year's uh, picture in July. This is just the first, the, well, this is actually, the, the, I'm in my second year. So this is the first year in full bloom. This is just six months after the other picture. You can see it just, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you're aware, but the azaleas can actually, a lot of people don't like azaleas and, and um, or I'm sorry, New England aster and uh, goldenrods, but they can be cut in June and July and also cut, cut plant can be cut um, off at June and July and they will still bloom. They, it will not kill the bloom on them because they don't get their flower until August and then they'll still flower, they'll be low and you can actually make a shrub out of uh, New England aster, it's gorgeous. Um, mm -hmm. Landing a variety of plants in your lawn and this is my lawn might be a little larger than most people's lawns, but you can make a 10 by 10 bed and do a Monarch Way station if you'd like to. And that would also qualify for wildlife habitat uh, with adding a water supply and uh, a couple of shrubs to uh, add cover. Ohio resources, there it is, there's Tony. This is her front yard. I was hoping I put this in here. I couldn't remember. This is her. You might want to write this down. I don't know if I gave it to the list uh, to Amanda for um, <clears throat> for the website, but she is going to add that. But this is a free newsletter. And Tony, you would probably want to see her before and after pictures. I should have probably put her. She had a regular a lot and she lives up in Dublin. And this is what she's done. And this picture is fairly old now. All of these plants have really, I mean, it's just absolutely beautiful. She takes a lot, as you can see by the picture, she takes, she gets a lot of wildlife in her lot. And those are the other resources, Monarch Way Station. This Monarch Pathways is a new site. It's an educational site on Monarch, Monarch butterflies and the rest of them will be noted by Amanda. And I'll see if she wants to see if there's any questions. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, please enter them in the chat box and I will um, share them with Barbara and hopefully she can give you an answer. Um, while you're thinking of questions, um, I will be posting these resources on obcinet.org um, so you don't need to worry about writing down all these links, um, but you'll be able to um, take a look at those um, in, in your spare time. But um, I actually <clears throat> had a question, Barbara. Would you mind um, just briefly outlining the process to apply um, for the, the certification? I know you covered everything that you would need to have to apply, but it, it, you just apply online and is there a fee to do Yes, that? there is. Um, you can apply online. Um, <clears throat> what you do is you go to um, 
I was going to shrink you down here and go to my... Can I shrink you without losing you? Yep. Okay. If you go to National Wildlife, just um, you could even put nwf.org. Mm -hmm. It takes you to their site. <clears throat> and if you go to uh, how to help, where we are, what we do, um, mm -hmm. how to help, how to help, and it takes you down. It gives you different things that you do. Become a wildlife federation, becoming a member, and then you go on further down. And it tells you how to renew, give money, join, become a, take action for wildlife. Go to take mm -hmm. action for wildlife. Okay. And there's where it tells you how to become a habitat, I believe. Make sure. Okay. Well, I can um, include that direct link then in our resources that I'll post online so people can. Uh, yep. Mm -hmm. There's all kinds of information on there. They actually have a couple of new programs, too, for families, where families can actually create, like, little clubs in their neighborhood, and oh, wow. they do, like, scavenger hunts and bird sites and things like that. They're going to be tagging monarchs this year. So I would check out the entire site. There's a lot of information on there. But um, when you apply online for Habitat, um, <clears throat> You also, um, it's like a, I think it's twenty dollars to fill an application. You can fill it out online. The application is not very detailed. I mean, it's okay. it's not. It, it gives you the options of what you need to have, and people are like, "Oh, this is so easy." But I think what you really need to do when doing this is um, consider what we talked about today. And um, what I thought was fun was when I applied to become a um, national wildlife ambassador. There's an actual a learning uh, program that you take and I learned so much through doing that that I think if I could encourage anybody today to become an ambassador for National Wildlife Federation I think that would be something you would really enjoy um, and then there's a sign you can purchase for your yard as well for okay. National Wildlife. Great. Well, thanks so much, Barbara. I know I learned a lot. Um, even I just moved into a new house a few months ago, so I've got lots of ideas for creating habitat even in my little suburban yard, so I do appreciate that. And certain things I didn't think of being kind of bird-centric um, to <laughs> of all the other species of wildlife that need our help as well. So thank you so much for your presentation. And um, again, I'll be posting this on our YouTube channel, so please share it with others. Um, that couldn't make it today. Um, and definitely plan on joining us next month for our presentation on fall warblers on August 22nd. And again, that's a Friday. So thank you again, Barbara, and thank you, um, everyone, for joining us.